Traveling through this world below, yet there's no sea.
and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue.
ask the congregation to please stand. This long tunnel is a shining light, for death is swallowed up in victory. But just think of stepping on shore and finding of touching a hand and finding it gone of breathing new air and finding it celestial of waking up in the glory
of waking up in the glory of waking up in the glory and finding you gather today in both grief and in celebration to give thanks for Larry Crabb. We mourn, of course we do, we mourn because the loss of Larry is great and yet we celebrate. We celebrate because the gift of his life is greater than our sorrow and our hope and faith in Christ is greater still. It's such an odd thing, isn't it, this work of grief to experience such profound joy and celebration for Larry's life at the very same time that we are experiencing such depth of pain and sorrow. And yet to experience them together is also the sweetest of gifts. We can only feel this depth of grief if we have loved deeply and been deeply loved in return. To feel only the pain and sorrow without the joy would be unthinkable. It would, it would crush us. And so we learn, don't we, to lean into the fullness of our feelings and know, knowing that all of them speak of our love for Larry and his love for us. Scripture tells us that we grieve, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Our hope is in the love of God. Our hope is in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Our hope is in the grace and salvation of Jesus. And so we worship today with great confidence, knowing that dying Christ destroyed our death and rising Christ restored our life, and Christ will come again in glory. As we begin our time of worship today, will you pray with me? Loving God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we come today to worship you as we give thanks for the life and the love and the teaching of Larry Crabb. You created us for relationship, first with yourself, but also with one another. And Larry helps us embrace both with greater understanding, with intentionality, with health. Be with us today, Lord as we celebrate and grieve. Hold us in your arms as even now you hold Larry. In this way, we are never separated except by the sheerest of veils. Today, O oh Lord, we stand on a holy ground in a thin place. Be especially with Larry's beloved Rachel with his adoring and adored sons, Cap and Ken, with their precious wives and their children. May we all feel your presence today as we lean into your larger story to do all we can to make you look good until that day we see you face to face. And with Larry, we are reunited again. In the sweet and saving name of Jesus, who is our Christ, we ask it with hope, with joy, and with longing for heaven. Amen.
Good afternoon. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> um, one of the questions that I am often asked is how our friendship with Larry began. Susie and I never attended the counseling program, either in Indiana or Colorado. We never lived near Larry and Rachel until four years ago when they moved here to Charlotte. And yet they are lifelong friends and mentors. I was looking through the shelf of books that are his that are in my study. And I came across the one that he wrote called Fully Alive. And what struck me was the way he inscribed the book to us. He said to Jimmy and Susie, Rachel and I so value our friendship. And then he said this, let's keep walking together all the way into eternity. And we'll keep doing that, Rachel. Well, it all began in the fall of 1983. I was a young pastor, and we were struggling with our lives, our marriage, our parenting, you name it, we were struggling with it. And I said that one night to our congregation that we were in a place of struggling, just asked for prayers, and a member of our church handed me a slip of paper. And on it was Larry's home phone number. He and his wife had come to know the Lord through Larry and Rachel when they lived in Florida. And I don't think he was supposed to give me the number, but he gave me the number, and so I called Larry, and I wanted to get some time with him. And I said, listen, we'd be happy to fly to, to Indiana, or whatever fits in your schedule, we'll do it. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'm doing a seminar in Dallas in the fall. Why don't you come and we'll have breakfast together? Well, that wasn't what I had in mind, and disappointed, but willing, we went to that breakfast, and that really became a turning point in our lives. After talking for about an hour, we asked Larry what he thought, and he asked the question, do you really want to know? Naively, we said yes, <laughs> and his response was this, Susie, you're a bitch, and Jimmy, you're a wimp. <laughs> that was the beginning of a lifelong friendship right there. <laughs> and I want to tell you why. He took a risk. He took a risk and spoke into our lives, and we felt seen, maybe for the first time in our lives. He also had a vision for who we could become as Christ was more clearly seen and revealed in us. And by the way, those two words that he used in 1983 are no longer the words that Larry used in how he sees us today. Today we seek to honor the life of a man who had the courage to speak the truth into the lives of many through conversations, through counseling sessions, through books he has written, through seminars he has held, through counseling programs he ran, SSDs, and all those types of things. And in every situation, his goal, his desire, was to point people to Jesus. Larry's name appears nowhere on the campus of the church I was pastored for, for over four decades, but his fingerprints we're all over Church at Charlotte, and they're all over my life. He was always challenging me to look to Jesus. And so I would ask you to stand and join in us as we sing together, turn your eyes upon Jesus. The words are in your program.
loss of my life, I have known four godly men who have seen me, pointed me to Jesus, and loved me well. And Larry was one of those men. The day when medical options for Larry's cancer were no longer helpful and the decision was made to end treatment, to the day of his passing, felt really quick to me. But for Larry, each day was too long. His suffering was long. But the suffering that he experienced for so many years fine-tuned his mind and his heart. It pressed him, and sometimes it crushed him. But in spite of his discomfort, he wrestled with God not to beat God, but to know him more deeply. He had many dark and sleepless nights with his soul in love. And instead of giving up on God, he planted his feet and became a fixed point. Larry was well known. He was well respected, well read, and infamous for serenading innocent bystanders to their Elvis song. More importantly, he was well loved by Rachel. Ken and Leslie, Kep and Kim, and each of his grandchildren. And he was the first person to tell me, in one word, exactly who I was <laughs> and the state of my heart. Oddly enough, he became a mentor, a friend, and my twib. Larry and I weren't blood relatives, but due to our shared health issues, our disdain for vegetables, our love for all things sweet, and our very odd sense of humor, we dubbed ourselves Twibs. And for the past 20 years, we rarely called each other by our given names. We always referred to each other as Twib. The Wednesday before Larry died, I had the honor of sitting with him. And as he drifted in and out of sleep, he and I would chat. At one point, Larry opened his eyes and asked me softly, how did we become twibs? And I replied, obviously due to our good looks. With closed eyes and a slight smile on his face, Larry said, twib, you underestimate us. In light of our shared grief, would you please join me in the responsive reading prayer printed in your program? Heavenly Father, we are grateful for Larry. We are thankful for the many blessings of knowing him and also for the lingering imprint of his life on ours. We are grateful, O oh God, for the happiness that was, even as we mourn the sorrow that is. You created our lives for unbroken fellowship, yet the constraints of time and place and the stuttering rhythms of life in a fallen world dictate that at times life will feel broken and incomplete. And so we find ourselves in this season bearing the sorrow of separation from Larry, husband, father, and friend. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, that it is a right and good thing to miss deeply those whom we love, but with those who we cannot be with. We willingly carry this ache. We carry it, O oh Father, to you. O oh God of comfort, lead us humbly through our heartbreak. O oh Christ, acquainted with all our griefs, remind us that only you can heal our sorrow. O oh Spirit, who moves in the midst of our sadness, fill us with confidence that you hear our cries. We praise you, knowing that our aching hearts are a true measure of the bonds between our hearts and Larry's. Now use our sorrow as a tool in your hand, O oh Lord, shaping our hearts into a truer imitation of the affections of Christ. Use even this sadness to carve out spaces in our souls where still greater repositories of holy affection might be held unto the end that we might better love one another. We now entrust all to your keeping. May our reunion with Larry be joyous. How we look forward, O oh Lord, to the day when our fellowship will be restored, eternal and unbroken. Amen. I miss my twib.
give up everything to see the face of God. We'd be hard-pressed to find a man who wanted heaven more than Larry. He wanted not only to get us into heaven then, but to get more of heaven's way of relating into us now. It's not often one man will spend his life facing confusion to bring clarity to others, embracing inadequacies to connect with others, facing discouragement to offer courage to others, and pretending about nothing in order to release others from the lies we tell ourselves. But when someone seeks as his highest calling to draw near to God, amazing relationships are born. That is the legacy of Larry Crabb. He was God-obsessed and radically centered on the deepest needs of others. I don't envision heaven as sitting at the feet of Jesus, always feeling a deepening delight in his presence. I do believe such delight will be the center of heaven, but that center will ripple out perhaps into more and far better books coming from my pen, maybe truths so unworldly that they will read like novels. Larry was born July 13, 1944, in Evanston, Illinois. A few years later, Larry's family moved to Philadelphia where he attended kindergarten all the way through high school. God could have imagined the plans he had for this son of a salesman. At age 10, Larry was awakened in the middle of the night and couldn't sleep. It's then he learned an important lesson. I got out of bed, I went to our little television room, and Dad apparently heard me getting up, and he came into the little room, and he didn't come in and try to do anything, he just sat with me. He didn't say a word. We watched television together for probably half an hour. And then Dad turned to me and said, think maybe you can sleep a little better now? And I remember saying, yeah, I think I could. Why? Because Dad related to me at a very profound level. He was with me. The power of being with someone was a preview of the calling God had on this man. Larry wrestled with doubt, questioning his faith. He didn't want to simply accept Christianity because it was his family tradition. He needed to know his faith was deeply rooted in his heart. After graduating from Ursinus College in 1965 with a BS in psychology, Lawrence J. Crabb and Rachel Joy Langford were married on June 18, 1966. Her maiden name was Rachel Joy Lankford. Her married name is Rachel Lankford Crabs. When she married me, I took the joy out of her life and made her a crab. Just before getting married, Larry began his graduate studies in clinical psychology at the University of Illinois and received his PhD in 1970. It was also in those years that Larry and Rachel's two sons were born, Kaplan in 1968 and Kenton in 1970. From the day they were born, Kep and Ken were Larry's pride and joy. Eventually, Kep and Ken got married. Kep to Kimmy and Ken to Leslie. And then the grandchildren came. Josie, Jacob, Caitlin, Kira, and Kensington. If you think you've seen every side of Dr. Larry Crabb, wait till you see him with his grandkids. You have never seen a more thoroughly engaged pop-pop. often 
once said if he ever wrote his autobiography, it would be entitled Sovereign Stumbling. You know, I look back on my life and where I've ended up, I had no plans to be here. I had no plans to be a psychologist. I had no plans to be a Bible teacher. I didn't know what I planned. So I've been stumbling along, making all sorts of decisions that I didn't know where they were heading. But looking back, God was sovereign all the way, and he put me in the position he wanted me to be in. So I stumbled, he was sovereign, working. Larry's career began shortly after graduating from the University of Illinois. He worked a year at the counseling center at the university before he and Rachel moved to Boca Raton, Florida in 1971, where Larry became the director of the counseling center at Florida Atlantic University. After being a psychology professor for a number of years, Larry went into private practice. There he found something he didn't expect. He was being transformed from a psychologist who happened to be a Christian into a Christian who happened to be a psychologist. He continued in private practice until leaving Florida in 1982. Two major callings surfaced during those Florida years. In 1975, Zondervan Publishing published Larry's first book, Basic Principles of Biblical Counseling, followed two years later by Effective Biblical Counseling, which quickly became the standard textbook for biblical counseling courses on most Christian college campuses. To say Larry was a prolific writer is an understatement. During his 45 years of writing, Larry published more than 30 books, his body of work is extensive, and it can be difficult to know where to begin. It touches on a variety of topics and themes, offers a host of wisdom, and like all of us, has evolved over time. Of the 28 to 30 books that you have written, which one is your favorite and why? I, I really think I can answer that pretty simply without a lot of thought. 66 love letters. What's true of all of his work is that it grew out of his own confusion and curiosity, his own narrow road. You mentioned the marriage builder, for example. That came out of a, a real crisis in my own marriage. Um, I wrote that book shortly after my wife and I had hit a real wall in our marriage. When a woman has a real vision for a man, as I think my wife has a real vision for me. We've written vision letters to each other. And her vision for me when I first let, let her read it to me some years ago just kind of stirred me to new heights. In my mind's eye, I picture you as the tree in Psalm 1. You are a tree, and so many people want to, even demand to sit in your shade. You're planted by streams of water. <laughs> How else could you make it without that living water? Because no one seems to be a shade tree for you. You yield fruit in season. <laughs> will not be retiring to golf, grandchildren are goofing off because he's giving you another fruitful season. The second calling that emerged out of those Boca Raton days came in 1976, when Larry launched the Institute of Biblical Counseling. It's worth noting, in the middle of those Boca Raton years, Larry began to get a glimpse of God's calling on his life, and he was not completely thrilled with the implications. I remember when I first had written a couple of books and it was just getting a little bit known, and really became very aware of my calling that I was to get into this and it was going to cost me. Um, and we were vacationing, my wife and I and our two young children who are now 51 and almost 49, so this is back some years. We were in the west coast of Florida, we were looking at the Gulf of Mexico. Got up at midnight, everybody was asleep. And I went on this long pier into the, into the Gulf of Mexico. The, the moon was bright, the water was still, it was a beautiful evening. And I walked out about 100 feet into the gulf from this pier, and I screamed at God for 30 minutes, and I said, I hate my call. The price is going to be too high. Let me out of it. And he didn't say a word, which I presume meant, you're called. In 1982, Larry, Rachel, Cap, and Ken moved to Winona Lake, Indiana where Larry had been asked to begin a Master of Arts in Biblical Counseling degree at Grace Seminary. Over the next eight years, Larry's name and recognition grew, with two of his books, Inside Out and Understanding People, being awarded the prestigious Gold Medallion Book Award.
I want to begin by publicly thanking our good God for the gift of Larry. I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of us. I also want to acknowledge someone who is unable to be with us here or in Denver due to the COVID restrictions. That someone is Larry's dear friend, Trip Moore. As, as Jonathan was to David in the biblical narratives, you, Trip, were to Larry. By your love and loyalty, you held up his arms at times. You challenged and stimulated his thinking. You laughed and anguished with Larry. You shared your own life, perhaps giving him freedom that there was somebody actually more messed up than him. <laughs> and we thank you for the critical and irreplaceable part you played in helping him do what God asked him to do. And it should not go unnoted or unacknowledged, my friend. I'm not sure who I would be today without the countless conversations, the laughter, the working alongside one another that has transpired over the past 35 plus years. Years ago, and I've recounted this story recently to a number of people, Larry and I sat in a hot tub years ago talking about nothing much when out of nowhere, and this will surprise no one who knew him well, he said to me, well, Kent, I think you have a lot of integrity, but no depth. I was not hurt by this assessment, nor was I offended. I was just happy about the integrity part, <laughs> which in my insecurity, my, I might have argued against. But now within days of my 60th birthday, I think that I can say that to whatever degree I possess those qualities, it is in large measure because of this man we honor today. At times, God graciously brings into our lives certain people who become his voice to us, who with words are able to put to order the internal chaos, who are able to see life where we see but darkness and confusion, and who do so in a context of safety and compassion. Larry was that person for me and perhaps for many of you. Larry said to his sons and also to me that at his funeral, he wanted us to talk about the bad things of his life, discouraged at times by funerals that he had attended in which only the saintliness of an inv individual was highlighted. Well, here goes. <laughs> Larry was insecure. He was at times critical. He could be impatient and surly. He was prone to bouts of doubt and deep discouragement that made him nearly incorrigible, and sometimes the conversation centered exclusively around him. Now, as I reconsider that list, I'm not sure who I'm talking about, him or me, or a whole lot of you who have come to follow him on his journey with and towards God and his Savior, Jesus. But here's the thing. These things that hung around the fringe of his life and ours did not define him. Instead, all of that stuff that mired him was actually fodder for truth to bubble up from the depths of his soul. Truth implanted at the right time by God's spirit for God's people. Walking down the sidewalk near the church building where I pastored, seeking to listen for God, I once heard the spirit say to me, Kent, whatever transpires in your life, it is not for you alone. It is for these people to whom I have called you. In that same vein, all that Larry endured as a man whose mind and soul were tortured became the fertile breeding ground for truths that have helped countless individuals find a way through the thicket of life toward a more personal faith with God. And because he was honest about those things often deemed shortcomings, the life of God was free to flow from him to me, from him to you, which is always a tribute to the sanctifying work of the Spirit. We become disgusted with ourselves, as was Larry, wondering if we've ever loved anyone, as did Larry. And strangely, the life of God is released from the depths of our souls. Having awoke early one day six weeks back, I sat somberly considering Larry's impending death. 
I began to write various memories I had with him, some eliciting laughter and others tears. It was part of my grieving process. Let me share a few. Larry introduced me to golf and because... And Lose. There we go. In part because he needed someone to mock. <laughs> On hole three at Rosella Ford Golf Course in Warsaw, Indiana, a par five with houses like magnets aligning the left side of the fairway, he would without fail ask me which house I was going to hit that day, <laughs> which prophetically would then become my reality. And speaking of prophetic, Carla and I have been rereading the pressures off, and midway through the book, it became apparent to us what we had known but perhaps feared to speak. God had asked Larry to carry a prophetic burden for the sake of the church, i.e., the people of God with ears to hear and eyes to see. A narrowing way of living further up and further in to the Trinitarian life and love of the Godhead. After speaking one Sunday, in my early days of pastoring, Larry and I went for a jog. Out of nowhere, and once again, this would surprise no one who's present here today, Larry said to me, I'll give you a B minus today. Growing in boldness, I retorted, I don't recall asking. <laughs> Undeterred, he proceeded to offer his lengthy and poignant thoughts, doing so without judgment. And while I could expend a lot of time listing many more memories, perhaps my most treasured is a time six or seven years ago when I called Larry and asked him to consider meeting me in Chicago. He and Rachel were living in Denver at that time, and we were in Warsaw, Indiana. He didn't hesitate. He flew in. I drove up. We met for two days, two days in which I vowed to share every corner of my soul with this trusted friend. Meals with long conversations separated by a couple of rounds of golf Countless questions from a man whose curiosity never seemed to wane. Those were dark days for me, and while I cannot say that something became clearer, what I can say is that I came to understand what the Samaritan woman at the well felt as she looked into the vision-filled, compassionate eyes of Jesus. I felt known. I felt safe. I felt believed in, called onward in this long obedience in the same direction. To know Larry was to be known by Larry in a way that was equally frightening and inviting. I imagine it's the same thing I would have felt had I conversed with our Lord and Savior. There are three things that come to mind when I think of Larry, three things that speak of God's life to me and others. I have heard or read others saying similar things and therefore I represent the masses in these reflections. First, I've always wondered how God can be so personal to so many people. There are millions of people who claim him as their God, and yet he is personal. How is that possible? But Larry gave me a glimpse in that he was so personally present with so many people. A friend named Jason only knew Larry for a year, engaging in five conversations, and yet he grieves in large measure because he felt in less than a year's time how Larry could be fully present with a person at any given moment. Year after year, school after school, one meal and break time after another, Larry would engage people's hearts and souls, singularly focused, enabled by the Spirit's eyes to see into our souls and say words that whether in the moment or down the road would breathe life into us. I grieve the loss of that for myself and for others. Secondly, Larry so believed in God's life in a person. Somewhere around the age of 24, sitting in his rather ordinary yet spacious office at the counseling center that doubled as the campus health center, Larry looked across his office and said to me, you really do want to know Jesus, don't you? I was tempted to look behind me as if he was addressing someone else. Those aren't profound words, but to that young, insecure man, it was the first time I felt truly believed in, as if someone was seeing something in my heart that I could not see, struggled to believe was present. It would not be the last. 
Those words that particular day anchored a solid truth in my heart, words to which I have returned countless times over the years. His words would often shine light into our hearts where we were tempted to believe that only darkness and chaos resided. Larry is still alive, not simply in the presence of God, but in my heart and in many of yours in sentences and truths. I do not understand, but grateful that over the years, hundreds of sentences filled with deep truths were implanted in my heart as Larry spoke publicly and personally as if they were intended just for me. And perhaps the greatest of these truths is that deeper than our sin and our failures is the life of God that yearns for release. Sinners we are, but even more we are saints who long to join a revolution to recapture the culturally profaned notion of love the deep and perfect love seen only in the community of the Godhead into which we have been marvelously invited and from which we are launched forward into a parched world. A relentless truth seeker also defined Larry. At the last school we worked back in October or November, Larry was talking about what it means to have a prophetic burden he said something about himself that we had previously never heard him say in all the schools that we had worked. In fact, when he said it, and said it with a clarity and conviction, and yet not overstated, Carla and I turned to each other, nodding affirmatively. He proclaimed that part of his prophetic burden was to ask questions. Larry fearlessly asked questions of God, of himself and others, and most acutely of God's word. And his questions opened up a person's heart as they also did the word of God. I have learned this from him. I am not as fearless, but grateful that he has been. As we have heard, Larry perhaps more than once stated that if he were to write an autobiography, it would be entitled Sovereign Stumbled. Well, my friend, you stumbled well. You did not settle for truths given to you 20 years ago or one year ago, even though so many of those reshaped our thinking, our faith, and our walk. You kept reaching, trying to say it afresh with more precision. You sought just the right word that would invite a person to say yes with a deep sigh of relief. You so loved words. You were not content with being a pretty good and sincere Christian. In your stumbling, you kept seeking to get out of you with pinpoint accuracy what God was showing you about the mysterious journey into deeper relationship with a big God. I knew your time to leave this earth was near when in the final days of your life, you said that while you could not understand why God allowed such suffering, never willing to settle for trite or what might even be meaningful answers for many, you profess that you would no longer ask the question. You would simply believe that when you stood before your God and Savior, all would be well, all manner of things would be well. It was a sign to me that your mission here on this earth was nearing its end. You were accused at times of changing your thinking some view that as a sign of instability and spiritual weakness. We saw it as integrity, as a man who was ever looking, ever hoping, who knew that God was too big to box. And thus, this should be a lifelong explore, exploration of who he is and who we are. You stumbled into truths like this one, that God was big enough to handle all of who we are. A truth that gave such life to so many. I heard just this past week, from a friend, those very words. You invited us to walk through whatever was transpiring in our hearts because going around it, often using God and his word deflectively, left us unchanged, shallow, distant to God. You taught us that God's spirit deals with us where we are, not where we wish we were or where we pretend to be. You modeled authenticity, allowing us to acknowledge our own failures and by doing so, to swim together in mercy and grace and compassion, weakening the power of competition and comparison amongst us, and thus enabling an occasional taste of true community. 
You helped us see the depth and insidious nature of sin so that the gospel became even bigger and better and brighter than we ever imagined, making the person of Jesus even more central in our minds and hearts. Your voracious appetite for reading introduced us to authors who offered more life, reframing truths in new ways and linking us to the great cloud of witnesses. You never wavered from your belief about the centrality of the church, not organizations per se, but communities of like-hearted people, people like those in Malachi's day who feared the Lord and to whom the Lord God bent his ear. You brought life to the word of God over and over, whether it was the Freedom Series, Off-Ramps, Job, Jonah, Jeremiah, Colossians, or countless sermons and devotionals offered around the world. You told stories on yourself that drove home these truths, none more hilarious and illustrative than Dr. Matterin or Tish. You sovereignly stumbled onto a new way that enlivened us, directing us away from the old way, too familiar to our flesh, into modern-day Christianity. You invited us to consider that despite our circumstances, no matter the condition of our souls and at any cost to ourselves, Jesus made it possible to love one another in a way that brought delight to our true Father. You said to me that you were more comfortable in the mess of a person's life than I was, open to stumbling around until the Spirit gave you a moment of wisdom. And that truth gave me permission to likewise hope and wait upon God's Spirit. You created charts and diagrams that sometimes caused us to laugh or perhaps even groan only to discover that those nearly unreadable scribblings actually captured the twist and turns of our souls. At the end, in the final months before we knew it was nearing the end, I asked you why you ever befriended me. On a sunny Tuesday afternoon 36 years ago, Larry approached me to ask a question. Up to that point, I'm not sure we'd had even had ever done more than greet one another if that. But you asked me to consider if I would sit up front in the main theory class called CORE and engage in a conversation with you regarding my story, my faith, and my marriage. You gave me time to think about it, all of about 12 hours. I said yes on Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. because I was afraid to miss out on something, not because I thought I had anything wrong in my life. And from that moment began a most impactful relationship, born of the Holy Spirit, one in which you became my father. The Apostle Paul said to the Corinthian church that they had not had many fathers, but that he, Paul, had become their father in Christ. I was blessed and privileged to have a spiritual father, one whose imprint upon me I cannot put to words, but one I offer up to God as an offering of thanksgiving. You treated me like a son, washing our cars together, watching the Chicago Bulls in their heyday, going to breakfast, writing me letters, taking me on trips you knew would shape my thinking, inviting me, us, to work side by side with you. I grieve your absence, rejoice in your release, and worship my God because of a life poured out and finished well. And while we will feel keenly your absence, your voice, we accept the challenge to be for others what you have been for us. We take the baton and continue to run the race marked out for us by your sovereign stumbling, perhaps with a bit more sense of determination and patient endurance so be it. Oh, merciful God, thank you for the gift of Larry Crabb. And to the Crabb family, I say these words to and over all of you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you, this, give you peace this day and forever. Again, I would ask you to stand with us as we sing this 
familiar hymn, It Will Be Worth It All.
1989, the Master of Arts in Biblical Counseling program moved from Grace Seminary to Colorado Christian University to the then Foothills Campus in Morrison, Colorado. Perhaps the largest shift in Larry's thinking happened during those initial years in Colorado, beginning with the death of his brother Bill and culminating with a cancer diagnosis a few years later. He was flying standby, the last one to get on. He was a psychologist as well. From Denver to Colorado Springs, the plane crashed and all 24, three crew and 21 passengers were killed that day. And I think that was the beginning of the shift that you refer to. Um, when, I, when I had lost my brother, that was the first obvious heart-wrenching tragedy of, of my life of that proportion and to watch my parents bury their older son. In 1996, Larry was given the honorary title of Distinguished Scholar in Residence at Colorado Christian University. Then, on November 29, 2018, after nearly 30 years of affiliation with the university, CCU honored Larry again by dedicating their new counseling center in his name. In 2000, Larry began the process of launching New Way Ministries and has hosted 77 week-long schools of spiritual direction over the last 20 years. These week-long intimate gatherings around God's larger story came to be known simply by their acronym, SSD. In addition to SSDs, Larry continued writing and teaching as New Way Ministries hosted other conferences, seminars, and webinars all the way to the end. In recent years, Larry has focused significant energy toward launching Larger Story, the legacy ministry started by Larry's oldest son, Kep, to introduce Larry's work and ministry to another generation of Christians. Lawrence J. Crabb passed away peacefully the morning of February 28, 2021, after 23 years of battling cancer. He was 76 years old. But if there's one thing I hope that is said at my funeral, he didn't quit. Yeah, that will be said. Larry, you never quit. <laughs>
not going to look up much so I can get through this. This feels like the first time I've been on stage with a mic. It's not. <laughs> Perhaps I've never had this much depth of emotion, both happy and sad. It goes deeper for me now than any other time I've been on stage. I'm usually speaking at insurance and tax conferences. <laughs> a little different here. I love my dad. He is my lifelong hero. 
Well, I read this 15 times to not do that. I can only imagine the ache my mom feels. Did he ever not have his arm around you? One of the many questions my dad asked repeatedly, and he asked a lot of questions. What is true about your life that could not be true apart from the cross? Well, if I did not know I would see my dad again, I couldn't face my grief. However, I can grieve with joy only because of the cross. I'm glad the service is being held 41 days after. I think I miss him more deeply and profoundly each day, which uh, is unique, but the memories um, bring back as many smiles as tears now. I couldn't begin to share the life lessons I learned through my father, but I certainly hope to put those into practice more faithfully than ever before. One other thing my dad always said, the best thing you can do as a parent is to love your spouse. He did that. My dad was deeply in love with my mom and pursued her with a steadfast commitment that lasted well over 60 years. It has been a ridiculous blessing for me to have my earthly father also be my spiritual father. As you heard in the video from our friend Duncan Sprague, that was his voice, he, he did a great job. And from Jimmy and Kent, my, my dad's call from God was not an easy one. I wrestled uh, on how to identify that call. I believe the real burden my dad carried with him throughout his life on earth was fighting for the beauty of the bride of Christ, the church. In individual lives, and in many other ways, he wanted to glorify God by jumping into the ugliness of sin inside the church and help present us as beautiful to Jesus. He trained professional therapists, but he always wanted to get soul care, real relational and raw soul care, back in the community of believers, specifically in the church, not by experts, but by elders and spiritually mature. When that is your call, you see the underbelly, the sin, the ugliness that is sitting just below the surface of our lives, and it was a burden he carried faithfully until his dying day. However, it was also in carrying that burden that he became more and more aware of what C.S. Lewis called an inconsolable longing that cannot be met in this life. A great marriage, slightly above average sons, uh, two amazing daughters-in-law, five grandkids that all know Jesus as their personal savior, along with a well-received ministry that provided well for his family, never scratched that itch. Uh, As Lewis so aptly stated, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, The most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Well, my dad is now in that other world. And the glimpses of beauty he witnessed in this world, the joy of relationships were just a taste, tainted by the fall of what he experiences now with no interruption. He loved beauty. He loved it, beauty in writing and music and sports and relationships, beauty in worship, beauty in God's word. The most beauty he ever knew but never saw till now is Jesus Christ. What I want to share today is my dad's last 30 days. From January 29th to February 28th, I saw him for hours and hours every day. He should probably almost 20 breakfasts, as his last breakfast out was only 11 days before he died. I'm sure you all know my family's very close. We always have been. My dad and I were also very close. The depth of our relationship grew after I became a husband and father. I'm so glad I got to know my dad as a middle-aged man myself. The truth is, I knew about many of his struggles. He shared some specifics about his Paul-like thorn in the flesh. But the reality is, my dad did not really have a private life. That's because he chose to put his private thoughts, struggles, joys, failures onto legal pads that became books. So rather than going back over his life as the video Jimmy and Kent all brilliantly did, I wanna share his thoughts his last 30 days and give us all a vision of what it looks like to die amazingly well. On January 29th, my mom and dad came up for the weekend on Friday. Dad from the sofa in our fireplace room announced that he needed to go to the hospital and wanted hospice right away. He had just that night lost the strength to get up on the sofa, off the sofa on his own. January 29th was the night when my dad asked my mom's permission to stop all medical treatments for his cancer, his diabetes, neuropathy. He even skipped his dentist appointment to fill a cavity. That seems to make sense. Um, That night was a long night. As I remember, for the first time, I really knew my dad did not have long. I'm a bit of a daydreamer, much to my detriment, some to my success. In my head, I had all my girls married off to great Christian guys, and somehow my dad was still at my youngest daughter's wedding. Those thoughts and daydreams came to an abrupt end on January 29th. I was just praying my dad would not die the next day because that's Leslie's birthday. (laughs) Um, I called my brother and let him know it's gonna be short. Um, And the following day, we looked at apartments near my house, knowing that with COVID and long-term care, facilities were not gonna be a good option. We found one, had it furnished, flat screen and all by Friday, uh, February 5th. 
Mom and dad stayed with us and my family through the Super Bowl, and they moved in on Monday, February 8th. During this time, we'd been making phone calls, having some folks come up in to say their goodbyes. Kemp and his family came in on February 9th, and we had an amazing final time with the 11 crabs all together. The times with all 11 of us were my dad and mom's favorite times. I've not been such a close witness to any person on their deathbed that could faithfully echo Paul's words to Timothy. This is the one that always tripped me up when I was trying to rehearse it. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Well, congratulations, Dad. You got your crown. That's the one that always got me. (laughs) All right. Most of the time with my dad toward the end of his life was spent reading the Bible to him, watching golf with no sound while listening to Elvis Presley and Alan Jackson sing gospel. My dad's favorite verse the last 30 days of his life was 2 Corinthians 5.8. Yes, we are of good courage and would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Unbeknownst to me, my dad began journaling on February 3rd and was able to write until February 15th. I'll read you some excerpts. February 3rd, 2021. I expect to die soon, perhaps in a month, maybe two or three months. I so badly want to spend time with my family, mostly Rachel, then I long to see Jesus. Perhaps I could call what I'm about to write, I don't know yet what words I will put on this paper, my spiritual will and testament. I intend to write what is going on in my mind, heart, and soul. I have never died before, so I am on virgin territory. (laughs) It seems very clear to me that I am to leave this world. Leaving Rachel, all family, so many friends, actually leaving them never to see them until they too come home seems so difficult, surreal, a first-time experience. I cannot process it. I can only feel a loss that one day will be fully compensated. That sustains my grief with hope. We will meet again in a much better place. Another excerpt. Life remains difficult, frustrating, nearly unbearable. But now it seems like Tom Brady throwing practice passes before lining up behind the center, waiting for the next Super Bowl to begin. But oh, what a feeble analogy. I am waiting for heaven to begin. Something good rises up in my soul as I ponder and anticipate heaven. So much that seemed important, life's opportunities for legitimate pleasure, life's responsibilities that required action, seem not only unimportant, but fully dismissed when I arrive in heaven. Everything will be dismissed as the reality of freely given joy uh, becomes my daily experience. Mostly such thoughts wander through my mind, though in moments they seem only a warm sun rising slowly into a cold morning. He was a good writer. Weak beyond description, reaching for a pen seems like a terrible chore. Yet I am comfortable, not at all depressed, just eager for heaven. I f- I'm, feeling, I'm feeling more certain of heaven when I die. It is strange, I can't imagine what heaven will be like. I suppose it's intended to be beyond my fondest and wildest imagination, of which I have little, perhaps none. A new body is promised. That sounds wonderful. Come back, Lord Jesus. I am ready. Spare me death. Come back. If not, death sounds wonderful. I am so surrounded by family, that element could not be better. (coughs) My dad lost his ability to speak shortly after Jimmy and I shared lunch on Friday, February 26th. Prior to that, his last words to Josie, Jake, Caitlin, Kira, and Kenzie were, I love you. The last food he ate was a cracker as part of the Lord's Supper for my non-Plymouth Brethren friends would say communion. The last thing he said to my brother and Kimmy was also I love you. The last thing he said to my wife was Thursday night when she said, Pop, I'm coming in for one more kiss, and he said in a very weak voice, 200 more. The last thing he told Jimmy and I, Jimmy went over to see him, grabbed his hand, said, Larry, what do you need? He said, Rachel, just give me Rachel. There was nothing left unsaid or undone. He finished the race God laid out for him. The very last words he spoke were on Friday around 1.30 p.m. We were listening to Alan Jackson sing Amazing Grace. And I said, Dow, Dad, wow, Alan Jackson can sing gospel songs great. And my dad said, oh, yeah, he's the best. I guess it's a little similar to my salvation and that one of the proudest things about my life is I'm Larry Crabb's son, and I had nothing to do with it. Dad, I know you told me you don't believe you would be able to see down, and even if you could, why would you want to? (laughs) Well, I hope that's not right, and I hope you can see us all here today and the impact you left in our lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love you. Just a few final thoughts. Christian, psychologist, and author. That's how I 
often heard Larry introduced, whether it was when he was speaking somewhere or in an article that was written about him. And while that's true, that's not how I saw him. To me, he was a gifted, gifted Bible teacher and a student of God's word. That was first and foremost. Kent, you had this same experience that I had, and Gail, you as well. I don't know if you know what it's like to have Larry Crabb sitting in the back of your church. Only those of us who stood in this spot can describe the facial expressions that he gave, which I thought while I was preaching meant what you're saying is pure heresy, young man. <laughs> I finally got Rachel to convince me that's not what he was doing. That was his way of saying, that's really interesting. I need to think about that. Um, but he was a gifted, gifted Bible teacher. And he loved God's word. We all have our favorite Larry Crabb book. And you heard him say his, and mine happens to be the same. I think my favorite book is 66 Love Letters. His imagined, inspired understanding of he and God having a conversation about each one of the books of the Bible. So my struggle has been, where do I center my message as I remember the countless conversations that he and I had that ranged all the way from Genesis to Revelation, most recently Revelation, but as I thought about today, I, here's where my thoughts landed. I, I want to go to the book of 2 Corinthians just for a moment. Because I think Paul revealed his heart in the book of 2 Corinthians. And that's my lasting memory of Larry, somebody who was willing to reveal his heart. So just a few verses where I think Paul and Larry shared a lot in common. Chapter 4 and verse 5 says this, For we proclaim not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. That was Larry's heart. To proclaim the gospel and the impact the gospel could have on relationships when relationships put Jesus on display for the world to see. Verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. Ordinary vessels meant to hold something, to hold the life of Christ, to be bearers of the most remarkable riches and power ever known in this world. And Larry, like Paul, knew that living the Christian life didn't come from trying harder, but from relying on and releasing the power of the Holy Spirit in his life, and that's what he sought to do. Paul says in verses 8 and 9, we were afflicted in every way, we're cru but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Larry was brutally honest. You heard Kent say that. He, he didn't cover up his struggles. Whether it was when he was in front of a group of people speaking or whether it was when he and I were having breakfast together, he didn't cover up his struggles. So many Christian leaders today cannot even admit when they have a bad day let alone being down and struggling and questioning what God is up to. That wasn't the Apostle Paul, and that wasn't Larry. So the conclusion Paul comes to, the conclusion is in verses 16 and 17. So we don't lose heart. Though the outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Larry didn't lose heart. He didn't lose heart in his Savior and what Christ had done for him. He refused to view life as so many of us do from the cradle to the grave. Rather, he viewed it from the cross to the coming of Jesus. Hope in the resurrection and the promise of eternity. He lived his life faithfully. Not perfectly but faithfully with a perseverance, which as he defined it was this, when you have nothing less to give, you give to others and you pour into them. And my friend did that. And while his outward body was wearing out, his inner nature was being renewed as he was ushered into eternity and the glory of life fully redeemed and whole. In the last published book of his, Waiting for Heaven, which is no longer the case for him, he's arrived, he said this, and I think it's an appropriate way to just end my thoughts. These are his words. Be where you are. Live in your darkness, your confusion, your struggle, your failure, 
It's your best chance for meeting God. He tends to meet us where we are, not where we pretend to be or where we wish we were. The degree to which you come clean and pretend about nothing and the degree to which is the degree to which you may discover your deepest thirst for God, who alone is guaranteed to still want you. You long to be wanted at your worst. And as I read those words, it reminds me of my friend. And I trust for all of us here, and for those of you who are listening online, that you have your hope securely placed in a personal relationship with Jesus, just as Larry did. For all the confusion about God and the questions about living for him that we shared, one thing was always true. He never stopped pointing me to Jesus. As I look out at his family, Rachel, no one feels the loss like you do. And beyond your family who I know loves you well, there are no, so many of us who love you and, and long to be there for you in the days to come, in those moments that feel overwhelming for you. Kep and Kimmy and Josie and Jake, our prayers for you guys. Our prayers for you next week as you have the privilege of doing this service again in Colorado to honor your dad. And Kenny and Leslie and Caitlin and Kira and Kinsey. You guys are in our prayers as well. Your losses are greater than all of ours, and as deep as I feel my loss, I can only imagine how deep it feels to the, all of you. And so we keep you in our prayers.
Come on, sing it. You guys can be seated. I want to thank everybody for coming. John, wow. <laughs> thank you. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Didn't she want to clap? Like, like, I know it's a funeral, but we're like, I wanted to clap the whole time. Um, uh, so our family is going to leave and head across to the reception where we'd like to invite you all. Uh, Jimmy will dismiss everyone else once we get out of here, and we'll look forward to seeing you at the reception. Yep, all right. Th thank you, guys. <clears throat> You stand as the family leaves, and I'm going to hang on to all of y'all while they scoot across the street. with heavy hearts and though our loss is great we leave remembering the hope of Jesus and the longing and waiting uh, for heaven knowing that that is ours we're going to wait just a few moments and let the family go across the street so right as you cross the street there is another um, part of our campus so there a large building if you will walk don't try to go in the steps the, the building upstairs, if you'll walk kind of down um, a slope and around to the back, it's the doors that are facing Highway 49. So kind of go down to the doors that face high, Highway 49, and there's several doors there where you can enter. And we invite you to have and come and enjoy breakfast with Larry, his favorite meal. It's prepared for you. God bless you.